He asked for permission, not for forgiveness. He did it backwards. <laughs> he asked for permission, didn't get permission, and then asked for forgiveness after he didn't get permission. It is, it is the wildest sort of, you know, hardest to pin down narrative. But you were literally being asked to try version 1.0, not just of a new gadget, but of something that is going to go inside your skull. This is the worst version of it that's ever going to be in a human. Or maybe someone else should go first. But ultimately, I just wanted to make sure that if anything went wrong, it went wrong for me and didn't have to be put on someone else's shoulders. And it literally takes constant screenshots of your screen, stores those locally, and then you can ask it, oh, where was that thing that Kevin sent me that was like kind of weird and- So basically, if you've always wondered what would it be like to have an FBI agent living inside your computer, you can now have that. I'm Kevin Roos, I'm a tech columnist at the New York Times. I'm Casey Newton from Platformer. And this is Hard Fork. This week, OpenAI wanted Scarlett Johansson to be the voice of ChatGPT, but then something got lost in translation. Then, Nolan Arbaugh, the first person to get Elon Musk's Neuralink implanted in his brain, joins us to talk about how a brain-computer interface changed his life. And finally, the Times' Karen Weiss joins to tell us about Microsoft's new AI computers and its plans to record every single thing you do on your device. I had an interesting experience recently. Yeah. I, uh, I went in a float tank for the first Ooh. time. Have you ever been in one of these? I have seen them in sci-fi movies. <laughs> Yes. Was this like a back to tank from Star Wars where you're healed <laughs> from your injuries? Yes. No, this is like a trendy new thing in the Bay Area where you basically go into these like pods. Like like imagine if like Apple designed a coffin. It's like okay. a it's like a it's like a shiny white uh pod the size of your body. Uh -huh. And you go in and it's filled with like uh, you know, a couple inches of very salty water. So you basically just lie there and you float for an hour inside this pod mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be, be relaxing. And was it relaxing? <laughs> sort of, sort of. I mean, it's definitely relaxing to be like floating gently in some like warm, salty water. Um, but it is a little claustrophobic because you can make it totally dark in there and do sort of sensory deprivation. Um, but the thing that actually made it less relaxing for me was that you um, they have music that you can choose from, uh, but the selection is not good. It's, what was the it's selection? Like, it's like cheesy yoga music. It's like pan flute. It's it, it's like you know chimes. It's not it's not what I wanted to be listening to uh, down there. Which was Espresso by Sabrina Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to be listening to. Yes. Kevin, let me ask you this: Have you ever heard of taking a bath because you're able to get many of the benefits of driving somewhere to float in two inches of water and you can choose your own music. Might want to look into that. That's true. That's yeah. true. But you don't have the experience of being buried alive inside an AirPods case. <laughs> what is going on with you? <laughs> Do we need to talk about this? <laughs> no, I promise. I'm doing great. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, that's great. You know, well, you and I should go into into a pod together and just start um, talking about tech news for an hour. <laughs> you know what they call that? What's that? Podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Kevin... Just as it seemed like things were starting to settle after some wild AI demos last week, a shocking statement from one of the world's most popular actresses has made us reconsider everything OpenAI has been telling us about its voice assistant. Yeah, this is one of the craziest tech stories of the year. I've been totally obsessed with every twist and turn. I'm very excited uh, to talk with you about it today. Now, did you ever think we would have a literal Avenger fighting back against the relentless <laughs> march of AI? Because that's sort of what this story is about. So last week, we talked here about the announcement from OpenAI about their new uh, GPT-40 model, uh, which was most striking for this very flirty voice assistant that they used in the demos they showed us. Kevin, remind us what was so striking about that demo. So the voice that they demoed, it was this sort of, you know, lilting female voice. It was uh, a little flirty, as you said. It, it sort of varied its <laughs> register. It kind of giggled at its own joke. Rocky, that's quite a statement piece. It was very lifelike and realistic. And basically, immediately, as this demo is going out, people start making comparisons to the movie Her and to Scarlett Johansson's character in that movie, Samantha. And like the, the company itself sort of made that uh, comparison. Yes, Kevin, and people are actually calling this the greatest act of cultural appropriation since Scarlett Johansson was cast in Ghost in the Shell. 
<laughs> you went there. That's right. So on Sunday, OpenAI posts to its website this mysterious blog post titled How the Voices for Chat GPT Were Chosen. And in the blog post, it says, quote, we believe that AI voices should not deliberately mimic a celebrity's distinctive voice. Sky's voice is not an imitation of Scarlett Johansson, but belongs to a different professional actress using her own natural <laughs> speaking voice. <laughs> Kevin, when you saw that blog post go up, did you have any idea what was going on? No, but it was one of those things where it's like my my uh, my sky is not an imitation of Scarlett Johansson t-shirt <laughs> is raising a lot of questions already answered by my sky is not based on Scarlett Johansson t-shirt. It was like uh, if if you were saying this clearly something is happening in the background, you did not just decide to come out of this with, from nowhere, and it was just a sign that things were going to get a little weird. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this blog post went up very late uh, Pacific time on Sunday, and to me, it was a sign that this was going to be a rough night, which is the title of a 2017 film starring Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> okay, so on Monday morning, things start to become a little more clear when OpenAI pulls Sky's voice from the app, and Joanne Jang, who is is the model behavior lead at OpenAI, talks to The Verge and says, quote, we've been in conversation with ScarJo's team, pretty familiar there, Joanne, yeah. because there seems to be some confusion. We want to take the feedback seriously and hear out the concerns. And uh, she further suggested that maybe people hear similarities because there are so few convincing female voice assistants around. Did that seem convincing to you, Kevin? No, of course not. Yeah, well, you know, to me, it just seemed like Scarlett was really trying to get under the skin of OpenAI, which, you know, <laughs> under the skin is a 2013 film starring Scarlett Johansson. Oh, boy. All right, so on Monday night, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson herself releases a statement, and this is the doozy, right? Yes. This is sort of what makes the world stop. And she really lays out quite a narrative, which I think we should walk through. Yes. So according to Scarlett, which is what I call her, Sam Altman had approached her in September 2023 about hiring her to voice ChatGPT, uh, saying that it would be good for everyone to see tech and creatives working together. And Kevin, you will remember that September was when they rolled out voices in, in uh, ChatGPT yes. in, in the app, yeah. right? So around that same time, it, it seems Sam has this idea. Um, and, you know, to me, this seems I can tell you're already annoyed by this bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Keep going. What okay. Scarlett Johansson movie uh, have, have you not mentioned so far? Well, I mean, to me, it just seems clear that when Sam approached her, he wanted the prestige of having her voice in the app. The prestige being a 2006 <laughs> film starring Scarlett Johansson. All right. So did you do her entire IMDb page? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> absolutely not. So at the time, she declines for whatever reason. And then she writes uh, in, in her statement, not Nine months later, presumably referring to last week, my friends, family, and the general public all noted how much the newest system named Sky sounded like me. And how did she feel about it? Well, she said, quote, when I heard the release demo, I was shocked, angered, and in disbelief that Mr. Altman would pursue a voice that sounded so eerily similar to mine that my closest friends and news outlets could not tell the difference. Mr. Altman even insinuated that the similarity was intentional, tweeting a single word, her. And this really threw me for a loop. Uh, she says that two days before the demo, Altman had reached out to her agent asking her to reconsider, but then OpenAI rolled out the demos with Sky before she could respond. So isn't that a wild detail? It's a crazy detail. I mean, like, yeah, we, we can talk more about what it means later, but that, this is the part where I'm just like, oh, they they screwed this whole thing up so badly. Yeah, and also, like, if there was a chance that maybe you could work it out, why wouldn't you, you know, wait for that? And I think the answer to that, by the way, is that they wanted to sort of upstage Google before its own developer conference. Yes. But just to sort of finish out this statement, she says that she and her lawyer sent two letters to Altman and OpenAI asking for a detailed accounting of the process that created the voice. And I think that is probably what led to the blog post that went up on Sunday night. And she closed with a call to action. And I don't know if we want to play the Star Spangled Banner underneath this. I do think it would sound nice. I'll just sort of read the quote. In a time when we are all grappling with deep fakes and the protection of our own likeness, our own work, our own identities, I believe these are questions that deserve absolute clarity. I look forward to resolution in the form of transparency and the passage of appropriate legislation to help ensure that individual rights are protected. Quick update from the future, everybody. We have some updated information for you. Yeah, you may be asking, why are we in different rooms? And it's because Casey got some new information. So Casey, what did you learn about OpenAI uh, after we finished recording this week's episode? So 
After that, Kevin, in the middle of the week, OpenAI puts out a statement which they attribute to Sam Altman, and it says, quote, The voice of Sky is not Scarlett Johansson, and it was never intended to resemble hers. We cast the voice actor behind Sky's voice before any outreach to Miss Johansson. Out of respect for Miss Johansson, we have paused using Sky's voice in our products. So, that was the statement in the middle of the week, and I have spent the last few days, Kevin, trying to figure out what in the Vicky Cristina Barcelona is going on here. <laughs> and what did you find? Well, I found, first of all, that is a Scarlett Johansson uh, movie. But okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, oh, I got yeah. that. All right, all right. So on Thursday, I had a chance to ask OpenAI some questions. And my first question was, who exactly at this company knew what the heck was going on, okay? And what I was told was this. The voice team decided they wanted to record five voices for ChatGPT, but after that, they decided, hey, it would be cool if we could get Scarlett Johansson. And as part of that, Sam Altman was sent out on a mission to get Scarlett Johansson, and according to them, that is when he reached out to her in September. And to sort of bolster this timeline, they did a couple things. They showed me a job posting from May of last year where they advertised for actors for these roles. And I saw the job posting. It did not mention Scarlett Johansson. It did not mention her or any other movies. Um, they played it did for not me. say only Black Widows may apply. <laughs> no, it didn't say that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, they then played for me a clip from Sky's audition uh, where she talks about you know, walking around with her toddler and basically just gives you the impression of, no, this is a real voice. This is not a composite of other people's voices, which is like one conspiracy theory that was sort of floating around this week. And then finally, they showed me a video clip uh, of the actor in the recording booth while they were doing this recording. Now, this video clip was very short. It was heavily pixelated, and it was taken from so far away that I couldn't even tell where the human was supposed to be until the second time I watched it. So I wouldn't say that that clip alone is giving me a lot of confidence in the narrative here, but I have seen some sort of video suggesting that at some point a human being was saying something into a microphone. Okay, so let me just repeat all this back to you and you tell me if I have the timeline and the version of events right. So OpenAI yeah. is saying that they did not initially plan to have a voice uh, of Scarlett Johansson or even one inspired by Scarlett Johansson as part of this chat GPT voice release, but that they later sort of came up with the idea, well, maybe we should have this sixth voice and maybe if Scarlett Johansson will say yes, then we can get her in as the sixth voice. That obviously never happened, but they are basically saying this is all. This was all never intended to mimic the voice of Scarlett Johansson. Any resemblance to uh, people living or dead named Scarlett <laughs> Johansson is purely coincidental. Is that basically what they are telling you? That is what they're telling me. And how do you uh, feel about that narrative? So, yeah, I guess I buy the narrow version of events that OpenAI is claiming happened here. Um, and, you know, I also have listened to clips of Sky and listened to clips of Scarlett Johansson, and they don't sound totally identical to me. So it is totally plausible that they had this other voice actor uh, play this role. But there are still two things that I don't quite, that aren't quite adding up for me. One of them is like, okay, say you didn't you know, cast a Scarlett Johansson sound alike, why then spend so much time around the launch of this new voice feature sort of making people feel like they were listening to Samantha from her to, to sort of directly connect the release of this product to this movie and this actress? Why do that if it, you know it's going to get you in trouble? And then the second thing is OpenAI itself has said in the past that they do not want their synthetic voices to sort of mimic public figures. In fact, there was actually a, a statement that they put out on March 29th earlier this year in a blog post that OpenAI wrote called Navigating the Challenges and Opportunities of Synthetic Voices. And one of the things they say in this blog post is that there should be a, quote, no-go voice list that detects and prevents the creation of voices that are too similar to prominent figures. So I'll be very interested if there is uh, litigation around this issue if you know any of the discovery, they find evidence that OpenAI employees were sort of talking about how similar this voice sounded to Scarlett Johansson, whether or not that violated their own OpenAI 
policy about not creating synthetic voices that were too close to the voices of prominent people. All right, now back to the episode. So let's talk about why this matters, because I can understand you might be listening and saying, this seems like kind of a small thing, right? It's just a voice. Hey, if super intelligence is coming soon, is a voice really what we should be worried about? But I think it's important for a couple reasons. And the first one, Kevin, is that the creative community is already deeply skeptical of AI, right? Last year, we had the SAG after strike, and this was a core plank of the fear there, which is that they worried that companies would steal an actor's voice and image, use it without their permission, and eventually either drive them out of a job or just drive their wages way down. So during that strike, actors were able to win concessions on this point. And now here you have a different case where Scarlett Johansson wakes up one day after saying no to this company, and now this sound-alike voice is the voice of ChatGPT. Yeah. So, Kevin, first of all, is what OpenAI did here legal? It it may be, it may not be. And it's a little hard to tell, but I can imagine that there's going to be some litigation or, or maybe a settlement. I mean, Scarlett Johansson has said that she has lawyered up. And there are actually two legal cases that people are sort of using to say about this case involving Scarlett Johansson and OpenAI that actually the facts would be uh, highly in her favor if she did decide to litigate this. Oh, do you want to tell us about one of so them? So one of them is a uh, a case from 1988 called Waits v. Frito-Lay. This is a case, uh, the Frito-Lay Corporation, makers of fine snacks, uh, decided that they wanted to make a commercial for a new flavor of Doritos. And they really wanted Tom Waits to sing in it. But Tom Waits is sort of famously anti-commercial. Like, he just didn't want to have his songs used to endorse products. It was, like, against his values. So they went out and they paid $300 uh, to a Tom Waits impersonator. <laughs> Basically, a guy who's in a band who sounds exactly like Tom Waits. And they put the impersonator in the Doritos commercial. They, they really said, waits, waits, don't tell me that you don't want to be in this commercial. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So then the commercial comes out. Tom Waits' friends start calling him and saying, hey, I thought you were against commercials. Why are you all of a sudden endorsing Doritos? He gets mad. He sues. And he sues not for copyright violations, because you can't copyright a, a sort of way of singing or talking, but for false endorsement. And a jury awards him $2.6 million. He's basically the heir to the Cool Ranch Dorito fortune at this point. <laughs> exactly. And congratulations to him. What's the other exactly. case? The other one is uh, around the same time, Bette Midler had a very similar thing happen to her um, involving the Ford Motor Company, uh, which went to her and said, hey, could we use your, your song, your voice, in a commercial for our new Mercury Sable? Yeah, be the wind beneath our wings, Bette Midler. Exactly. So she says, no, I don't really want to endorse products. So instead they go and they hire one of her former backup singers and basically instruct this backup singer to sound as close to Bette Midler as possible. She takes this to court. She wins $400,000 in damages. So I think Scarlett Johansson has not, I would never say an airtight case here because there's no such thing, but I think she has a very strong case here. But but even setting aside the, the legality of it, Kevin, I'm curious to get your thought on what this does for public perception, right? Where are we right now on how average people are thinking about AI, what role it might play in their life and, and whether it might threaten them in some way? I mean, I think this is the most sort of damaging thing to to come out of this particular episode. It's not actually, you know, I'm, I'm sure they will, you know, they will figure out a way to sort of make things right with Scarlett Johansson or they'll go to court. But I think the broader damage here is to the, the public trust in OpenAI. This is a company that has said, you know, we are building something that will eventually become an artificial general intelligence. We are doing this for the good of humanity, and we want you to trust us on that. And I think they got the benefit of the doubt for a while because they were releasing things that were cool and useful to people. ChatGPT, you know, was a, a moment where a lot of people said, "Okay, maybe this is maybe they are, um, you know, at, at the sort of head of the pack here, and maybe we're okay with that." Then I think we we saw things start to decay a little bit with each successive release, and the, and the sort of overall vibe being that this was actually not sort of a, a nonprofit research lab as it had been started, but was actually something more like a very traditional tech company. And so I just think we've seen a gradual erosion of that trust from the public in OpenAI, and I do ultimately think that hurts them long term. I, I agree with you. I think this has been a really bad month for the perception of tech amongst average people. I think this is a moment where we have seen tech companies get really greedy and greedy at the expense of working people. And so like as May is coming to a close on 
on one side of the ledger, you have Scarlett Johansson and an, an entire creative class of workers rallying around her. And on the other hand, you have OpenAI sound alike voice, Google AI overviews eating the web, and the Apple hydraulic press from the commercial like crushing everyone into a fine pulp, right? So I think the tech industry needs a better story to tell here than we're coming for your voice and there's nothing you can do about it. Totally. So there's a second thing that I want to talk about, though, Kevin, which is the implications of, of this story for OpenAI, because I think it recontextualizes one of last year's biggest stories, which was Sam Altman temporarily getting bounced out of the company. So can you just remind us what happened in November to Sam? Yeah, so he was uh, fired in a surprise uh, move by a number of members of the nonprofit board that uh, governs OpenAI, um, along with Ilya Sutskever, who was the chief scientist at the time. And in, by way of explaining why they were firing him, they made these kind of vague statements about how Sam had not been, quote, consistently candid, and just basically implied that he was sort of a slippery person who was uh, telling different things to different people and who they had sort of lost faith in. Uh, uh, but they never sort of gave many concrete examples of that. And so I think it was tough for people to understand, like, why make such a sudden and uh, important decision in sort of the dead of night uh, without consulting anyone. And so he sort of, Sam sort of had the the trust and the faith of OpenAI's employees. And so they rallied around him. They all, remember they were gonna briefly go, all go work at Microsoft. And then uh, the board members end up uh, being sort of pushed off the board. And uh, Sam is brought back as the CEO. It's a wild story, but I think a very interesting thought experiment for me over the past week has been, what if the board coup had happened now? Now. Yes. What if the board had waited to make its move on Sam until now, when I think uh, I, I think it's fair to say he would not get the same benefit of the doubt from the employees or the investors in OpenAI that he has today? I think that's true. Now, this is a company that is valued at, what, 80 to $90 billion. I think the employees who are working there want to see the equity that they have in that company realized. And I think that there's a very good chance that if, if what you um, just laid out happened, those employees would still support Sam. Sam. That said, you're right. We would have a good example of why this board might be a little bit concerned. I know, at least for me, ever since, you know, as, as we did our own reporting, we talked to people involved in that situation. I have thought since November, there might be another shoe to drop here, right? We may eventually learn what the board was so concerned about. And I feel like this week, for the first time, we actually know now. Like, it is this sort of thing. Yeah. But I actually, as, as strange as it's going to sound, I don't think this Scarlett Johansson voice thing is actually the worst thing that has happened to OpenAI over the past couple of weeks. What do you think it was? So there was this other story that came out uh, just recently about these employee agreements mm. at OpenAI. And this came to light after uh, Ilya Sutskever and Jan Lakey, who were the heads of the company's super alignment team, uh, both announced they were leaving the company. And... Um, you know, people started looking into the, the paperwork that OpenAI employees have to sign when they leave the company. And recently, Kelsey Piper at Vox reported that there was a really unusual provision in this exit paperwork that basically said that if OpenAI uh, people left the company and then spilled the beans or said something or disclosed something about the company or disparaged it in any way publicly, they could not only uh, you know break this contract, but they could have their vested equity clawed back, which we should explain why that's such a big deal. Yeah. So normally, you know, you go work at a tech company, you get stock options. Some of those stock options vest over time. This is traditionally sort of how tech employees make a lot of money. Their stock options vest, they sell them, they get the money. So it is not unusual when you leave a tech company to have your unvested equity forfeited. What is extremely unusual, and actually I've never heard of this happening before in the tech industry, is for a company to say, we can actually take back your vested equity if you've left the company and you disparage us publicly. So this was something that a lot of OpenAI uh, former employees had been terrified of. It's a reason why we haven't seen a lot of former OpenAI employees speaking out. And when it came, when it became public, a lot of people in the AI industry said, this is crazy. We, we have not seen this at any other companies. They are trying to silence former employees from speaking out. And then you saw actually Sam Altman 
make this statement about it where he basically said, I didn't know about this. I didn't know this was part of our paperwork. I've been trying to get Scarlett Johansson to be the voice of ChatGPT. You think I have time for this? So he said, we've never clawed back anyone's vested equity. Um, basically, he said, he said, this is one of the few times I've been genuinely embarrassed running OpenAI. I did not know this was happening, and I showed up, and we'll fix it. So the reason I think this is actually a bigger deal than the Scarlett Johansson thing, despite it not getting nearly as much attention, is because OpenAI is in a talent war. Right, They are constantly trying to pick off the best AI researchers from all of the biggest companies in Silicon Valley. It's a very talent-heavy uh, business and talent-dependent business. And if they start losing people who say, this company seems like they're they're slippery and I can't trust them, I think that is an existential threat to them in the long term. Hmm. Well, look, you know, I, I, if, you, if you're wondering why you've never heard me give an interview where I talk about what it's like to work with Kevin, I have signed something very similar. Um, <laughs> but you're right. It is very unusual, particularly for a company with Open in its name. And I agree this was another black eye for the company this week. It also, of course, came on the heels of their entire super alignment team being dissolved, which we discussed last week. So there's just kind of a lot of swirling drama around that company. Now, we should also say, while all that's going on, OpenAI's business is doing great. I don't want to pretend that it's not. Altman was on stage at a Microsoft developers conference this week, which we'll talk about in a, in, in a little bit here. There has been some reporting that Apple and OpenAI are going to announce a big partnership next month at Apple's own developer conference. There, and finally, there was reporting this week that uh, on the day that the um, uh, GPT-40 uh, model was announced, OpenAI's revenue shot at more than 20%, according to third-party estimates. So clearly OpenAI is doing great, but this the sorts of things that we've seen this week have given me some pause, and I wonder if they've given you some pause that you, as you think of what is the future of this company. Yes, I think the, the correct way to phrase what I've been feeling this week would be vibe shift. Mm. I think there's been a big vibe shift around AI when it comes to the creative community, but especially with open AI as it relates to the, the sort of trustworthiness of what they're building. Um, and I, I, you know, I've talked to people who say, you know, I basically gave this company the benefit of the doubt. I gave Sam the benefit of the doubt. Um, they seem to be saying a lot of the right things. And now they're just kind of like, I don't know, man. And I, and I also think it's like, I, I was thinking about this sort of idea of like the, the sort of Silicon Valley builders mindset of like, uh, you know, ask for forgiveness, not permission, right? And I think that's been the way that a lot of successful companies have been built in Silicon Valley. Uber, you know, Facebook to some extent was a story of asking for forgiveness, not permission. And I think that that works with most technologies, but I think with AI, it's a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's also like he did, he asked for permission, not for forgiveness. He did it backwards. He, he asked for permission, <laughs> didn't get permission, and then asked for forgiveness after he didn't get permission, which right. is not something. But that no, he didn't even ask for forgiveness. He said he said I would never ask for forgiveness because there was nothing to to apologize for in the first place because this voice isn't based on Scarlett Johansson. It is it is the wildest sort of you know hardest to pin down narrative. It is. I mean, look, the thing that this brings to mind for me, Kevin, is that you and I both covered the decline in public perception around Facebook, right? And Facebook once seemed like this silly little toy. No Nobody paid too much attention. Then after the 2016 election, everybody is like, wait, is this secretly a mind control device that is, you know, making all of our teenagers insane and everything else? And obviously it's way too soon to say that something like that is, is happening to open AI. But I'm telling you, this is how it starts, right? I think more and more people are becoming convinced every day that whatever AI is going to be in the short to medium term is not going to be a good bargain for them. And they're not going to give open AI the benefit of the doubt. And that means that open AI, I think, needs to be really careful and how it makes its next several decisions around this kind of stuff. So look, I'm glad the Hollywood A-list is paying attention. If you are worried about what a company like OpenAI might do with your voice or your job, you're in good company, which is a 2004 movie starring Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> oh, good, good. I was worried there was one Scarlett Johansson movie we weren't gonna mention. <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk to a guy who's had a computer put directly into his brain. So Casey, as you know, 
one of the technologies that is fascinating to me right now is the brain computer interface or BCI. That's right. In fact, it's so fascinating to me that I forced you to try one uh, a few weeks ago. And I think it's safe to say it was not all that impressive. No, I was willing to go through with it because I've always wanted to see if we could detect any brain activity for you. But <laughs> afterwards, I thought, I can't do this anymore. So just to back up, brain computer interfaces are uh, a, a te type of technology that allows you to basically control a computer directly with your brain. Um, and this has been something that obviously science fiction has been talking about um, and that scientists have been actually working on for decades. So the company that is perhaps best known in this space is Neuralink, Elon Musk's brain computer interface company. And uh, I've just been fascinated by this whole area. Um, I, I made you try one. It was an, it, what's called a non-invasive brain computer interface, which means it's not inside your literal head. It's like a headband that you wear. And it doesn't work that well. The technology was not all that impressive. We didn't end up airing the segment where we tried this thing on because it just wasn't very good. But with Neuralink, uh, the, the, the implant, the brain-computer interface, goes literally inside your skull, on your brain, and it allows you to control a cursor with your mind. So I, w I think we should tell people a little bit kind of about like what this thing is and what it looks like, because there are these threads that have electrodes on them that penetrate into the brain, and those electrodes read signals, which then get translated through the Neuralink device. And that's where I've lost the plot. So can you pick it up from there? <laughs> yeah, so it basically translates your electrical activity in your brain into commands to control something on the outside of your body, like a computer or something like that. And for uh, you know years now, tech companies have been looking at using BCIs to help uh, people who have debil debilitating conditions like a spinal cord injury or a stroke or some limitation on their mobility. But also, a lot of people in Silicon Valley just talk about this as a potential next step in computing altogether. In the future, um, you know, some or all of us will have these kind of brain-computer interfaces. And, uh, and I've even heard people in the AI world say, this is the way we are going to stay ahead of the robots as the AIs get smarter, is that we are going to implant computers in our head that will basically increase our own cognitive capacity. Now, that technology does not exist. It is mostly, you know, just an idea from science fiction. We have no idea whether that would work or not. But this is a big, important technology that a lot of people in tech are excited about. And just over the last few months, we've actually seen one of the clearest views yet into how this might work in a real human. Yeah. And while you've just spun out some really fantastical sci-fi scenarios, Kevin, what appeals to me about this story is that it is a case of technology helping one one person who had something really terrible happen to him. So I want to say up front, very few people have been as critical of Elon Musk as I think the two of us have been on this show in particular. And as hard for me as it is to set aside my personal feelings, particularly about what he did to Twitter, I truly am so inspired by how this technology is helping one person. And I think it is absolutely worth understanding what is this thing that they built and how has it changed the life of at least one individual? Yeah, so today we have a really special opportunity to talk to the one person on earth who has actually gotten the Neuralink brain computer interface implanted in his skull. This man is named Nolan Arbaugh and he now has a, a computer system about the size of a coin and a bunch of threads with electrodes that connect to his brain that allow him to do things like move a cursor around on a computer uh, with just his mind. And this is a big deal for Nolan because for the last eight years, he's been paralyzed from the shoulders down. He had a freak accident uh, eight years ago where he suffered a severe spinal cord injury. And so he has been a quadriplegic for the last eight years. And he volunteered to be patient number one in this Neuralink experience. So today we're going to talk to Nolan about what having this Neuralink device in his brain has been like, how it's changed his life, and why he volunteered to risk his body on this unproven new technology. Let's bring him in. Nolan Arbaugh, welcome to Hard Fork. Hey, nice nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, where are we catching you right now? Uh, we'll just describe where you are. Um, I'm in my house, uh, in my bed. Um, so if you hear any weird noises in the background, it's my bed. Um, I have an air mattress, so it's kind of blowing air through the whole thing all the time. Got it. Um, where, where's but, home for yeah, you? I'm in, yeah, I'm in Yuma, Arizona. Cool. 
Um, so it's been a crazy last few weeks for you. Um, back in January, Elon Musk announced that the first uh, human patient had been successfully implanted with a Neuralink device, but he didn't mm. say the name. Uh, it's only really in the last two months that your name has become public and just the last week or so that you've started to talk uh, more broadly about your experience. What has it been like to be sort of the literal face of this technology? Yeah, it's been all right. I'm just here trying to get all the information out to as many people as possible. I think it's an amazing technology. I think what's going on um, in my life and what I foresee uh, the future will hold is worth bringing um, the whole world along with. Um, so it's been cool, man. Um, I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to sort of before you got this Neuralink device uh, implanted in your head. What compelled you to register to participate in this extremely, uh, you know, new and untested experiment? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know much about it. My buddy called me up one day and uh, kind of gave me the five minute rundown. I wasn't expecting anything to come from it. So I like made a few jokes on my application. Um, and, you know, I just I figured I would never hear back. And then once I did start hearing back, I had to think about it a little bit more seriously, had very serious um, candid conversations with my parents, um, my friends. And ultimately, when it came down to it and I was selected, I decided that I just wanted to help. I knew that I wanted to help make it safer for everyone after me. And I knew that I wanted to, you know, try to make a difference uh, in the world and something I've been trying to do, something I've been looking for for eight years. And this seemed like the perfect opportunity. Mm. Do, you, do you remember any of the jokes that you put on your application? Yeah, yeah. I said I um, wanted an Iron Man suit. I said that I wouldn't mind being um, uploaded in the Matrix. Um, you know, just things like that. Right on. Right. Um, yeah. One of the truisms that Casey and I have learned in reporting about tech over the past decade is that you never want to try version 1.0, right? It's, it's risky to try yeah. the first version of anything because the bugs are still being worked out. Usually there's some, some, some rough edges. Um, but you were literally being asked to try version 1.0, not just of a new gadget, but of something that is going to go inside your skull. So was that part of your process of thinking through this like no one has ever had one of these put in their brains before um, maybe I want to let someone else be the first person yeah it, it crossed my mind something that my buddy and I the buddy that called me on the phone um, we talked about at length was just uh, you know this is the worst version of it that's ever going to be in a human uh, maybe someone else should go first and I'll get a better version later on down the road or maybe I don't do it at all and wait for it to be on the market to the public and then I'd get an even better version. But ultimately, I figured that I have a pretty um, solid foundation with my faith in God, and I just felt like um, if anyone's going to do it, then I should. I've thought my entire you know, accident was that I'm glad that it happened to me and no one else I know because it's just a very hard thing to experience, you know, being a quadriplegic, and I wouldn't ever want any of my friends to have to go through this. Um, so it's just a mindset that I've had forever, and... Um, with the Neuralink, it was the same thing. Like, if anything were to go wrong, I would feel terrible if I passed up to wait for a better version and something went wrong to someone else. So I, I knew that it had to be me. Your uh, parents are your primary caregivers. What were your conversations with like them about doing this? Yeah, they were really hard for a while. Um, I mean, as a quadriplegic, the only real thing that I have left is my mind, mm. is my brain, is my personality. And... Um, it's it's hard to let someone um, go in and kind of rummage around up there, especially with something that's never been tested in a human. So uh, one of the things that I mentioned to them was um, that if I had any sort of brain deficiency afterward, if I was mentally handicapped in any way, that I didn't want them to take care of me anymore, that I wanted them to put me in some sort of home. Um, because taking care of a quadriplegic is hard enough, but taking care of a quadriplegic with a traumatic brain injury is something that I would never want my parents to do. So I made them agree to that. Yeah. Were you nervous like the night before the operation to install your Neuralink device? Um, what did you find yourself thinking about as you went to bed? Um, yeah, I wasn't nervous at all. Um, I was just excited. My buddy and I were sitting around making jokes, uh, just kind of I don't know, hanging out the night before. I just wanted to get it over with, honestly. What kind of jokes were they making? <laughs> um, 
we were planning on uh, releasing some like cyborg related jokes, you know, <laughs> thinking of things that only I would be allowed to say, um, you know, just random like turns of phrases too, like, oh, blew my mind, picking my brain, like, things like that. Um, yeah, it, just just all sorts. I, I'm curious if you had a thought like, you know, as you were heading into this surgery of what the first things you wanted to do would be once you had a working brain computer interface. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big gamer. I wanted to play games. That was one of the big things I wanted to do. I also wanted to be able to read. I mean, there's nothing like being able to hold a book again and the smell and the feel of a paperback book. It's one of my favorite things in the world and something that I've missed for a long time. I can't do that. Um, and so the next best thing is just being able to read in general. Um, I've had to listen to audiobooks for you know the last eight years because I haven't been able to sit in the same position to read a book and um, I had no way of like turning pages. I can do it sort of on a Kindle, but uh, I was listening to audiobooks and I don't really like listening to audiobooks, to be honest. Um, sometimes the narration is terrible. Um, I'm not, I don't want to throw shade, but I remember reading um, like an Aragon audiobook and the voice that the um, narrator had for the dragon made me turn it off immediately. <laughs> um, I was like, this is, this is quite possibly the worst thing I've ever heard. In my it life. was Gilbert Gottfried <laughs> yeah. voicing the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> no, that would have been amazing. I would have listened to that on repeat, honestly. Um, no, but just something as simple as that, mm. being able to, like, you know, lie in my bed and read a book. Like, yeah. there's just, there's just something about it. Um, so I was really looking forward to that kind of stuff. So, mm. how was the actual surgery? Was it long? Like, what was the recovery process like? Can you tell us just about the the actual yeah. implant? Yeah, it was super, super quick. Um, we got to the hospital at like 5 a.m. I think I was uh, scheduled for surgery at 7. There was a lot of just getting me ready, getting me in bed. The surgery was supposed to last between like four to six hours. Um, they were expecting there to be hangups. They were expecting, you know, say like the needle on the robot to break. They brought, I think, 20 iterations of that needle in case it broke and then they had to stop and replace it. And the needle didn't break once. Um, so just everything performed uh, above and beyond what they expected. And so the surgery took under two hours. Um, and then I was out of surgery and they prescribed some like pain pills. I didn't take a single one. I don't know. It was just so easy. Um, the worst part was I wasn't able to shower for the first few days because my incision um, needed to heal. But outside of that, like the recovery process was so easy. Like I didn't feel any pain at all. Wow. And when you woke up from your surgery, like what was actually different? Did, did you feel different? Um, and, and then sort of how long was it before you actually got to like turn on and use the Neuralink device itself? Yeah. Um, I mean, I had a gnarly scar with some staples in it. I mean, that was pretty freaking sick. Um, <laughs> like I was, I was super happy about that. I got some cool pictures. Um, but yeah, I think within, I don't know, like an hour or two after my surgery, they came in and connected me to um, like a little tablet they had. And I got what, to what do you mean connected of... you like like literally yeah. plug something into your head or like what? No, is it no, Bluetooth? It's, a, it's a Bluetooth connection. Yeah. So they they just wake up the implant with a little uh, coil, like a charging coil, almost like the same thing that you put your phone down on a mat to charge. It's very similar. You just hold something over my head and it wakes up. Uh, it's how you charge it as well. I put that in like a hat and I wear a hat and it charges. Um, and so they woke it up, they connected that to a tablet, um, and on the screen, they just showed a bunch of the channels. Uh, the channels are each electrode in my brain and those electrodes are picking up like neuron firing. Um, and so they showed me say like eight channels and I got to see like live, like real time, the neurons firing in my brain and everyone just kind of freaked out in the hospital room. Everyone started cheering. They were clapping, which was totally unnecessary. Um, <laughs> it was so awkward. Uh, but yeah, it was it was really, really cool. Right. I'm, I'm so curious, Nolan, about the actual experience of using this Neuralink device, because one of the things that it allows you to do is to control a cursor on a screen as if you were like using a mouse just by thinking. But I've never known like how... like. You know, when I'm using a computer, I'm not thinking I'm going to place my cursor here. I'm going to click this button. I'm going. I'm. I'm. It's just like it's a. It's a much more kind of fast twitch sort of unconscious response. I'm curious do, when you're trying to control a cursor on a screen, how intently do you have to think about it in order for the cursor to actually react? 
I mean, at first, I wasn't very good at it. Um, I was doing what we call like attempted movements. Attempted movements are basically, you know, like I said, all the signals uh, in my brain are still firing. So the threads are implanted in my motor cortex. And so when I attempt to move my hand, um, those signals are firing, the implants picking that up, and an algorithm is basically learning what I'm trying to do. And after doing it a certain amount of times, it'll uh, translate that into cursor control in some way or another, and then it'll keep learning. As I was like a week, week in, maybe two weeks in, I just thought to move the cursor in one direction, um, and it moved. It it blew my mind. Like it was it was so wild. But then over time, um, it just becomes second nature. It's not like I'm thinking like cursor come over here and like I'm waiting for it to get there or anything. It's just it's very very um, like I said intuitive. And and how like fine grain is the control you have over a cursor now? Is it like roughly equivalent to like what it used to be like when you were using a mouse, or is there still a gap there? Uh, I would say it's very similar. I'm not as quick with a cursor as a lot of other people, but I don't think that can't be made up. Mm-hmm. I think that just comes with um, a bit more practice and also just a bit more tweaking on the software side. Like we're still, this is still very early days, a few months in and we're already where we're at, which is amazing. I think by the end of my um, time in this study, whenever that will be, I'll be better than most people with a cursor. I mean, one of the details that I just love from uh, the initial reporting on your story is that after you got your Neuralink, uh, you played eight straight hours of the video game Civilization VI. And uh, I just love that because it's like, I, I imagine that, you know, you had doctors years ago thinking that in theory, if this ever, you know, this brain computer interface thing ever worked, it would allow people to, you know, re, you know, do more types of creative labor and, uh, yeah. and, and be more productive at work. And, and you get this and just immediately start gaming, which I think shows that you just yeah. have the heart of a, of a true gamer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I keep telling them that I keep saying, you know, I'm just so unproductive with this. And like, don't you guys like give me more things to do? Like I would much rather be doing work. And they're like, no, just do what you want to do. That's what we want is to make you um, able to play games, to go surf the web and do things that you want. It's not about, you know, what other people believe you should be doing or anything. It's just whatever makes your life better. Yeah. And waste so, your life like the rest of us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. On. That's what I'm saying. I'm no better than any of you guys. It, so. I mean, it makes so much sense though, because it's like for, yeah. for what, eight years you had been deprived of being able to just like mm-hmm. use your hands to play games. I love to play video games. Like I play video games myself every week. And mm-hmm. I guarantee you that if I had been in your shoes, I absolutely would have been playing a uh, civilization on day one too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, now, is it also true that you played Mario Kart? I did. I did. Very early on, maybe a couple weeks in, um, they hooked me up to a Switch. <laughs> and that was very, like, hands-on. They were real-time, um, like, tweaking things. Right mm-hmm. now, we're working on, you know, giving me that capability on my own. Yeah. Um, so any day I want, I could just hop in. I think that's pretty close. That's, right. that's amazing. Now, I, I want to know, like, how different this is from other assistive technologies that have come before it. Because we've had things like eye tracking for computer control mm-hmm. before um, for people who have lost mobility. Yeah. Um, so have you tried any other ways of controlling computers before this? Um, and, and sort of how does this implant stack up to other things that people have been using to do uh, similar things in the past? Yeah, I've tried it all Um, from, you know, the first few weeks, first few months I was in the hospital after my accident, they had me trying everything and sure things have gotten better since then, but they're just not even in the same league as Neuralink. Eye tracking, uh, they're just not as good. A lot of it has to do with, um, you know, being centered on the screen, making sure that your levels don't change. Uh, I have really bad spasms. I'm very spastic. So if I move at all, like my body spasms to the right and I'm off center, then the eye tracker doesn't really work anymore. Um, I've tried other things like a quad stick. And there was a video of a guy, um, a quadriplegic, who was using a quad stick to play things like Fortnite and stuff. I tried. I tried playing uh, like one of the Call of Duty games that come out when my like after my accident. And I hopped on and tried the campaign. And I think they're storming like the beaches of Normandy 
and I didn't even make it off the beach. Um, <laughs> Which well, was so unfortunately was real the case for so many people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, yeah. so it's it's a very real, yeah. real case. I was going to say, no, that uh, happens to me too when I play uh, team shooters yeah. because I just get my, mm. my butt kicked by 11-year-olds, so I'm, uh, I'm yeah. sympathetic. Yeah, what's your excuse, Ruth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Nolan, I want to talk about thread retraction. Mm. This is something that has happened since your surgery. Um, mm. A lot of the threads that connect uh, the, the Neuralink device to your brain actually started retracting. I, I saw a figure of that 85% um, of them had, had retracted, and this was potentially endangering your ability to use this device. So talk with us about this and sort of what, what the first signs you experienced were that something wasn't right. Yeah, a few weeks in, um, I just started losing control of the cursor hmm. is what it comes down to. It would um, start drifting on me. I would want it to go right and it would go left. Um, I could not get it to go down, things like that. And um, it, it just became impossible to use. Um, and then, you know, about a week later, so this was about three weeks in, about a week later, um, they told me that, you know, they had seen some evidence of thread retraction, but I think they had only found out like a day before. They kept me in the loop the whole time. Um, yeah. So, so they actually took a yeah. scan of your brain and said, it looks like we can see that the mm. threads have retracted? No, no. So like brain scans won't even um, show the th threads. What they can do is look at um, the electrodes over time um, and see which electrodes on the threads are sending signals and which ones are sending strong signals or weak signals. And so they can really tell like which um, threads are, uh, which electrodes are still in my brain. And so right now it's about 15% plus or minus, I think uh, 5% um, that are still uh, actively sending like strong signals in my brain. And do they have any theories about why these threads had come loose? Yeah, it has to do with how much uh, the human brain moves. Apparently, they had thought that um, everything they had read, all the surgeons they had talked to, said that um, the brain moves about one millimeter. And then when they implanted everything in my brain, they found that my brain moves actually three millimeters. Um, so it's uh, on a scale of three X what they were expecting. So... Obviously, this is not like fixing a computer or an iPhone or something where you can just like open it up and fix it. Like the, the opening up would involve mm -hmm. opening up your yeah. head and your yeah. skull and, and doing brain surgery on you again. Um, so how did they go about trying to fix this? Yeah, I offered them to go in, um, go in, take out the implant and put in a new one. I was like, if it's going to get me back to peak performance, then that's what I want. If it's going to help me stay in the study... I offered that and they said, no, we're going to like stop, take a step back and um, see if we can fix this on the software side, which is ultimately what ended up happening. Um, they just tweaked the way that they were recording signals um, from the threads um, and from the electrodes. And that ended up working there. There were a couple different ways they were recording um, the neuron spikes in my brain. I mean, there's a ton of information coming from the neurons at all times, and they were trying to interpret those spikes in a certain way. Um, and they had found that the way that we started was the most efficient. But then once all the threads started retracting, they needed to rethink that. And so they switched to a different way of recording those signals. And they found that that was actually much better. Yeah. And, and so like, wh where are you at now? Like Neuralink has said that your, 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 your performance with the device is now better than it was before all of this happened. Does that continue to be the case? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still getting better too. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like some people that I've talked to, um, in the tech community believe that BCIs are going to be a major platform shift, not just for people who uh, are disabled or who, who lack mobility, but for everyone. Um, and that, you know, the, the next big platform shift may not be people putting computers on their head, like with VR, it may be people putting yeah. computers in their head. And, and eventually we will all be walking around with these brain implants. Based on your experience, do you think that is a plausible future here? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, I think they're safe. I think the um, possibilities are endless with this technology. I mean, we're just scratching the surface. Um, we, I don't know what kind of things people are going to be able to do with this in 10 years. I don't think anyone really knows. There are applications that we see can be useful, like helping cure paralysis or different uh, motor, motor diseases, um, helping cure blindness. But once we start getting into all of that, 
then you know that begs a lot of other questions like if we can do this why why can't we do even more and you know with the ai revolution that we're in right now like how can this be applied to um all of these pieces of hardware in our brain um i just think we're in for uh, an explosion like exponential growth in this field especially now that Neuralink has come out with this it's going to bring all the other bcis up and it's going to push Neuralink to get even better um, it's going to be like a new space race, but in the brain. You know, I'm, I'm curious to get a sense of what this has just been like for, you know, you were, you were talking earlier, I, I was really moved when you were talking about just craving the experience of holding a book in your, your hands again, something that I take for granted. And now, presumably, you've been able to read books, you've been able to play games. Mm. What is, like, what has this done for you emotionally to kind of get access to some of uh, those things that you had been missing out on? I mean, it, it's hard to even put into words. Yeah. Just this amount of independence that I've been given, um, it it changed my life for the last few months. Um, it's changed my parents' lives. Um, little things, I mean, very, very little things have made huge differences. Like when I was able to get a drink of water on my own in the middle of the night because I got like a little bottle that stretched across my bed um, and allowed me to have drinks in that in the night that relieved about 90 percent of sleepless nights that my parents had um, and now with Neuralink it's even more than that I'm able to do a lot more on my own than I was never able to do in the last eight years and I don't have to wake anyone up in my family to come help me in the middle of the night I don't have to feel guilty if at 2 a.m. I want to connect and read or listen to an audiobook or play a game or just go on and check my social media or text someone back. I don't have to feel guilty about trying to wake someone up. Um, there's just so much that I'm grateful for being able to do this. And ultimately, I want to use it to help people, um, find some way to help people. And I'm on the path to doing that. And that's what I've wanted since I was a kid, just to find some way to help people. And after my accident, I didn't think that was ever going to happen. I knew that I could still speak, but I mean, who would want to listen to me speak about, you know, nothing. I had no like life experience to give them. I guess now it's a bit different, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's been such a huge blessing to me, honestly. Yeah. I'm curious, Nolan, what have your conversations with Elon Musk been like? Mm, I haven't had many. Um, I talked to him uh, on uh, like FaceTime right before surgery. Um, I was like, hey, thanks for choosing me to do this. Um, I'm really excited, really thankful, really blessed. And he was like, yeah, you know, this has been great. Really looking forward to it, making a huge step. And I said, let's rock and roll. He was like, let's do it. And that was it. And then after surgery, I spoke to him uh, in person. He came to the hospital. Um, I was still pretty drugged up on anesthesia and I couldn't get his sweet bomber jacket out of my mind. <laughs> I was just lying in my bed thinking the whole time, don't mention his bomber jacket, don't mention the bomber jacket. Um, but it was cool. I think we have um, very similar ideals about what this can do for uh, humanity and, you know, where we can go from here and just our drive to help people in that way. Um, I think it's amazing that someone of his caliber has stepped up and stepped into this uh, role for helping people like me. I mean, I never thought anything like this would ever happen to me or to people like me. Um, and to have such a high profile figure say, you know, I'll, I'll take that on and I'll fight that. And uh, it, it's just amazing. I'm curious what you make of the promises that people like Elon have made for how BCIs could improve in our lifetimes. He did get a little criticism a few years ago for some statements he made at a Neuralink presentation where he suggested that these BCIs could eventually allow blind people to see or give people um, with spinal cord injuries like the, the use of their full bodies back. A lot of health experts were very skeptical and they basically said, you, it's irresponsible to say this stuff given that the science is just nowhere near there yet. And I'm curious how you feel when you hear the kinds of lofty promises about what this technology may be able to do someday. Do you get excited or do you say like, hey, wait a minute, let's like stick to what the science is capable of now? No, I'm super excited about it. Um, it gives me and people like me something to hope for. I mean, that once you take away hope, that's the end for most people. Um, and for him 
to promise something like that, even if it never comes about. It's just the fact that he's trying and he sees it as a possibility. I take that kind of passion um, to heart. Um, I don't agree with people who say that uh, it's irresponsible. I think it's a reality from my perspective that it's going to happen probably in my lifetime. And if I'm irresponsible for saying that, then like, I'm sorry, but it gives me something to look forward to and gives me something to strive for and to work towards. And maybe I fall short of that, but um, I'll be damned if I don't give it my all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's very clear to me about you, Nolan, is that you just have like a, a much higher risk, risk tolerance than, than I do. Like yeah. I get nervous to go to the, to the doctor to get like some little, uh, you know, thing. And you here are saying, I will volunteer. I will step up to be patient number one for this very severe, uh, use of technology. So, um, yeah, my hat's off to you for just being willing to put your hand up for it. Yeah, for real. Thanks, man. All right. No, well, great to, great to talk to you. Thank you so Dude, much for your time. you're awesome. Thanks so much for coming hey, on. thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. I really yeah. appreciate it. When we come back, speaking of putting chips into things, we'll talk about how Microsoft is putting AI chips directly into its new computers. Mm, a computer-computer interface. <laughs> Well, Casey, it is the most exciting time of the year in the tech industry, which is developer conference season. That's right. For a lot of people, Kevin, this time of year is about dads and grads. For us, it's about APIs. <laughs> so last week, we talked about Google's uh, I.O. A developer conference and everything they showed off. And this week, uh, Microsoft had its big annual developer conference called Build. Um, you did not go in person, did you? I did it, and candidly, while, while I read some coverage of this, I, I want to learn so much more because you know I only had so much time left over after I finished researching the filmography of Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Microsoft obviously is also very excited about AI. They have been building out a lot of their own AI tools and products and services. And this week at Build, uh, they actually demoed some new hardware that they are making that is sort of built around AI. Now, isn't putting AI directly into the computers how Skynet began in the Terminator films? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's been a while since I watched those movies. Oh, but no. I think Microsoft gets less coverage by tech journalists like you and me than it deserves, in part because a lot of what they do is like boring enterprise software stuff. But, you know, they are the biggest company in the world, and they have been investing in AI significantly over the past few years. And I would say between their stake in open AI and all of their own AI projects. They're just a, a major, major player in this world. Yeah, and it's true. I probably don't pay as much attention to Microsoft as I should, and it is for a somewhat selfish reason, which is I just use Macs, <laughs> and so sometimes it feels like this stuff just is not as relevant to my life, but let's face it, for most of the working world, they are doing their work on a PC, and so if Microsoft says we're putting AI in it, then we should be paying attention. So, to talk about this and everything else that Microsoft announced, we're going to bring on my colleague, Karen Weiss, who covers Microsoft for The New York Times. Yes. She went to Build, and she's going to tell us all about what Microsoft announced. Karen Weiss, welcome to Hard Fork. Happy to join you guys. So, Karen, you actually went up to Microsoft's headquarters earlier this week for their annual Build conference. So just set the scene for us a little bit. What, like, what was it like? Um, did, how did it compare to previous experiences? Well, I think what was unique was on Monday, they tried to really hype this AI PC announcement. And they did something on the campus, like the big headquarters in Redmond, just outside of Seattle. And you had to be in person there. They weren't live streaming it. And Satya was going to give a keynote at it. So it was trying to definitely build attention. And so, you know, they tried, it was like a lot of hoopla, basically. And it was yeah. in this, there's a lot of like ums, ums music in the background and stuff like that. And they tried to recreate the magic, if you will, of when they launched the Bing Sydney mm -hmm. chatbot that shall not be spoken of about a year and whatever ago. <laughs> yeah, and that all turned out great. Karen, one of the things that Microsoft announced are these things called Copilot Plus PCs, which, uh, as I understand it, are basically a personal computer, a Windows PC that is basically built to run AI and that runs it uh, very fast and that is sort of all wrapped around the capabilities of these AI models. So what did they actually announce and sort of how is it different from the, the Windows PC that, that people use today? Yeah, the main thing is that these PCs have a bunch of 
AI models, AI systems locally on the computer. And they can run different AI tools or models uh, because they have this new type of processor, essentially. It's called a bear with me, an NPU, a neural processing unit. And it is very quick with really little drain on your battery. Because the problem you have is when you run AI, it's like super intensive, right? It's running all these calculations constantly. And so this is a whole new generation of of chip. I, I guess I'm just struggling to understand what it means for AI to be able to run locally, because I also have run large language models locally on my hard drive before. And is, is that what they're saying? Is that you'll just, if you want to run something like a chatbot, it'll just be much faster to do? Or are there actually capabilities that these will have? Is it going to be so deeply woven into like the operating system that people's experience of their computer will actually change somehow? Right. So they are hoping the latter. You'll be shocked to hear. But basically, the idea is because there are these things that are run locally, they can have access to information that is only stored locally, and they can be faster and more interactive in a way where, you know, even right now, when you go into a chat bot, you ask your question, right? And it, it like takes a second and then goes boop, 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 and each little word kind of comes out one at a time. This would speed that all up as well. And so they're hoping that by putting these different, they have said there were more than 40 models that can run, can kind of come pre-installed, so to speak, on the laptops. And their hope is that developers now start playing with those and build tools off of it. And they liken it to the iPhone where the iPhone said, oh, wait, here's a, you know, GPS, here's a, a altitude meter, like all, whatever kind of tools are in the hardware, people start building it. And then you get Uber or whatever type of system that then made the iPhone this kind of like key platform for people to build off of. And so I think there's a reason why they announced this before their big event for developers is because they're trying to say to developers, build for this. There's there's a future here. Now, I think speed matters a lot. I do think that that can really uh, change the way that this stuff gets used. And I could absolutely see this becoming a developer platform. But at the same time, Karen, I am reminded of the last time that Kevin and I went up to Redmond for an event and we were told Bing has AI now and AI is going to change everything. And I think we were optimistic that maybe that would be the case. And then you fast forward to today and Google is still by far the most dominant search engine in the market. So I wonder, as you're hearing this presentation telling us that AI chips inside PCs are going to be a next generation kind of PC that, that is truly going to change everything. I wonder, what did you think of that? I think the difference between this and Bing is Windows. So mm. Windows is this ubiquitous operating system that Microsoft controls. So when they announced this, it wasn't just them trying to get up, move from a tiny market share. They have this enormous market share, and they had all of the biggest laptop makers in the world there showing off versions of these devices. Mm. So I think they have a power or an influence on the PC in a way that they don't necessarily in search or with mm -hmm. Bing. Um, that said, they have to prove the utility of these things. And part of why running the models locally is important is it's cheap, right? You pay mm. for the processor up front when you buy the laptop. But every time you ping it, you're not spending a penny. Whereas if you're inferencing things in the cloud, if you're running things off the cloud, it becomes really expensive to for a developer to think, oh, can I even afford to offer this product to people? And now if they can just do it locally, it might not be quite as good. Like the 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 uh, models, the language models that can run on a laptop now are not as good as chat uh, as GPT four, mm. but they're they they say about as good as GPT three point five, which was mm. what you know a chat uh, GPT was initially launched with. So you can get some like good enough uses is the theory. Got it. But again, they have to find you know the kind of key use cases that will show it. And I was a little surprised the um the examples they released with were not they they were. Clearly trying to demonstrate certain capabilities. Like it what? Was what, did not, they, what did they demonstrate? Some were a little more speculative and futuristic, saying this is the kind of thing you would be able to do. So like one was a dad speaking with the a voice chatbot, essentially asking for help on how to solve the particular Minecraft situation. No worries. I'm here to help you impress your son. I see you've got a crafting table in front of you, which is a great start. To craft a sword, You'll need some materials. Can you open your inventory? Just press E on your keyboard. Yeah, uh, do I have what I need? Let's see, you've got some sticks, perfect for the sword's handle, but it looks like you're missing the material for the blade. You can use wood, stone, iron, gold, or diamond. And the voice thingy can come in and then say, 
oh, well, you got you need these materials to build this new thing in Minecraft, and therefore, oh, hurry, this thing just popped up. Go run over there and hide in this basement thing. And it was because gaming is real time that you can't do that if you're pinging the cloud. It's part of why streaming games is so hard. Um, and so this was an example of a way where you could bring in generative AI and assistant into like a real live moment, essentially. Mm. But that was one of the more futuristic products. It's like yeah. not launching with that. Right. I, I want to ask about this uh, other feature that they announced that I think got a lot of attention, which is something called Recall. Mm -hmm. um, what is Recall? They, they liken it to a photographic memory. And it and it's actually kind of makes sense because what it does is it basically builds a history of everything you have looked at on your laptop. With Recall, we're going to leverage the power of AI and the new system performance to make it possible to access virtually anything you have ever seen on your PC. It's going to be, honestly, as if you have photographic memory. And the ability to access this memory with simply your words in a form that's natural for you. And it literally takes constant screenshots of your screen, stores those locally, and then you can ask it, oh, where was that uh, thing I that that Kevin sent me that was like kind of weird and he laughed when he told me about it. And since you and I are of course chatting on Teams, Kevin, on Microsoft <laughs> Teams, it would be like, oh, that we can pull that up here because the transcript says that he laughed in this moment and it you can kind of scrub back and forth in time trying to visually look for what you were searching for. So basically, if you've always wondered what would it like to have an FBI agent living inside your computer, you can now have that. Perfect. Yeah. Under your control, Casey. So <laughs> there's an app called Rewind that has been doing a, very, something that sounds very similar to this. But but just so I'm clear, this is this is taking screenshots. It is storing them on your machine, and then it is allowing you to use generative AI to sort of search back through your previous encounters with your computer and say, what was that restaurant menu I was looking at last Tuesday or whatever. But like, I'm, I'm curious, Karen, what you think the, the target audience for this, who is actually use, going to use this feature? And like, who, what, what examples did Microsoft give of how it might be useful? They gave some of kind of personal uses. They had this very funny example of this woman trying to get a um, help, like her family trying to get a, a dress for her grandma. And they talked about how they she you know she had searched things online. She had chatted in Discord with her abuela, which I thought was very funny because like I know my my grandma used to AOL instant message me, but I'm not sure how many grandmas are on Discord. But the idea was that there's this like digital record, and you can go back and be like, oh, what was that sparkly one? And you can use language like that, and because it has visual intelligence. It can go back and look for the sparkly blue dress you had looked for. And then, oh, didn't, didn't Abuela say that she actually really liked a pantsuit instead? And then you can kind of find the pantsuit. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a personal one. Like, I was recently shopping for jeans. And part of me is like, oh, I could see that. Like, where was the jeans that I liked? But also, I'm scared if I were to type in, like, jean, wide leg jeans I was just looking at. How many wide leg jeans would show up? It's kind of mortifying to think about how many wide leg jeans you need to find to find a good pair. <laughs> totally. So, you know, I can I can see all of those use cases. At the same time, all of us are journalists. We often talk to people off the record confidentially. We have sensitive information on our laptops. We're not alone in that. I think most people working the jobs have some sort of confidential information that is on their computer. So I hear everything that you've just described, Karen, and I think absolutely not. I tried Rewind for a while. I found it terrifying and deleted it from my phone. What, what is your thinking right now about whether a lot of people are going to be willing to invite this level of surveillance onto their devices? Yeah, I mean, the default is definitely to take all of it. You can go back in and manually delete certain days. You can have it opt out of certain um, certain applications. But like, if you're going to opt out of the web search, like that's one of the main uses yeah. for it. So it's a big question. That said, um, it's defaulting to being there. And one of the things when I was kind of researching before this, uh, before the event was, a lot of people haven't interacted with chatbots. They haven't used ChatGPT, but they get a, a basic Windows laptop from their work. And mm. there's a big old button that says, you know, Copilot on it. And these tools will be there. And for many people, it might be the first time that they really have exposure to it. Also, how, I'm not sure people will understand the technology behind it, and that it's literally taking a picture of everything that you're 
you're right. doing. And, and we should say, like, you know, Microsoft has said uh, that all of these screenshots stay on the device itself. It's, they are not being sent to Microsoft. Microsoft has also said, you know, they're not doing any kind of, like, content moderation on them. So, like, if you've been looking at your, you know, bank account information on your PC, they're not going to, like, scrub that from the screenshots, but that it will all stay locally on the device. And so only the person whose device that is can access that. But I think there are a lot of questions that people will have, especially, you know, if this is maybe a corporate issued uh, computer uh, does my employer then have the ability to go back and look at screenshots of every time I've ever used this computer uh, of course they will and as this stuff gets normalized I can imagine, I can imagine employers employer handing you your your shiny new co-pilot plus AI PC and saying you have to leave this recall feature on and then if we ever have a disciplinary issue with you or we are just suspicious about you for whatever reason we can review Everything you have ever done on your corporate issued laptop, that seems like a nightmare dystopia to me. And they can search for it easily. <laughs> yeah. Because they now have the search tool. <laughs> right. Your, your only uh, chance to survive that is just that they're using Bing search, which doesn't work most of the time. <laughs> well, Karen, that brings me to one of my other questions about all of this stuff that Microsoft announced this week is like, who is it for? Because I think traditionally Microsoft, a big part of their business is selling to businesses. It's enterprise customers. It's you know large companies that already run a lot of Windows PCs that already use Outlook and Teams and all the other Microsoft products, and they can just kind of keep adding to that bundle. So do you see these AI PCs and all the features that are on them as being aimed at businesses, or are they really making a consumer play here? You know, I initially thought beforehand that it would be more of the businesses. Businesses buy literally the majority of laptops now. When was the last time you guys refreshed your PC? Mine was in 2011, I believe. Um, you know, you're but... eligible every three years at the New York Times. <laughs> oh, no, no, so... my personal one. When was oh. the last time you bought a personal one? <laughs> Wait, your PC is 13 years old, Karen? <laughs> Are you what running you Windows 98? This, this was the whole, this was the, it's a MacBook and it's lasted and like for the internet, right? Everything's yeah. on the internet that I do now. I'm not like downloading my, ripping my CDs anymore and taking my music from from one thing to another. You're not so, mining Bitcoin? I'm not mining <laughs> okay. Bitcoin. Interesting. I was surprised, though. They they um, definitely sort of benchmarked it and kind of compared it to the MacBook Airs. So they're smaller. They are lighter. They say they start at $1,000. So they're not like Chromebook prices, but they're also not a MacBook Pro super heavy thing. Karen, I'm curious like, how this positions Microsoft against Apple. Apple's having its own developer conference uh, next month, and there's a lot of speculation that Microsoft's announcements uh, at this event uh, this week were sort of designed to kind of take some, uh, you know, some attention away from anything Apple might announce uh, in just a few weeks. Apple is also expected to do a lot around generative AI uh, in its own hardware products. So what is the competition between Microsoft and Apple like right now? These uh, these chips, these new NPUs, do like propel the performance of these laptops basically in the realm of Apple now. So it's in the same class because they've chipped changed over this uh, chip architecture or style essentially now to a model that actually Apple had been pursuing. So the question is, will people make the jump from one ecosystem to another? Will their employers make a jump from one ecosystem to another? All of that stuff is, I think, I don't know the answer to that. But they are clearly trying to show that they are building like even their hardware with this kind of AI first mentality. And again, if people want that, if they can demonstrate the utility of that, that's like the kind of question about all of this. Yeah, I just think so much of this is going to depend on how Microsoft implements all this stuff and honestly, like how annoying they are about it. I mean, one of the so I, you know, I have a Windows PC. It's my daily sort of PC that I use. And I would say most of the time I really like it. But then there are just these times when it's very clear that Microsoft is just getting a little bit greedy and they just start popping things up or putting things in weird places. Like the other day, I was using my computer and I, I got a Skype news alert. Have you seen these yet? <laughs> I, I've seen somebody posting these on threads and it's so funny. It's so funny. I was just minding my own business, doing email. Up comes this little notification. It says Skype says the, the U.S. economy added this many jobs last month. And I'm like, why is Skype talking to me? Did I ask Skype to talk to me? No, I did not. But that is just a classic case of Microsoft sort of trying to juice engagement by doing something that I think a lot of people would feel is very annoying. 
going. So I can see these AI PCs being very useful and I want to try one, but I think that if they can't resist sort of, I don't know, just trying to nudge you into using it more and more or in different ways, I think that is going to turn a lot of people off. I mean, I think a lot of AI things are going to be nudging you more and more because they want discoverability is that phrase that you hear a lot about, about the features that these things can do. You know, this is a huge Alexa problem, right? People know Alexa can do the timer or whatever, but she can she can do more and they want you to do more, but like they got to push it to you. Otherwise, how do you know? So I think that's a very hard urge to resist, even though I completely understand and agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, again, I, I, Kevin, I'm like you. I would like to give one of these things a try, see what it can do, see how fast this AI is once you get it on the device. But I do continue to have trust issues with Microsoft. This is a company that just last month started testing ads in the Windows 11 start menu. So every time you go to like look at the programs on your computer now, you might just have to see an ad. And I don't know, the more AI is on my computer, the less I'm excited about a company that is looking to shove ads into different parts of the interface. You know, imagine you're 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 going to you know shop for jeans for abuela, and then oh you're looking for that that well here's an ad for that now Karen right so there's just a lot of stuff in here that sort of has my uh, my eyebrows arched. Karen, did you actually get to try any of this stuff? Did you get to get your hands on one of their new AI PCs? Yeah, they had like a demo station set up, and so like it's populated with like all the demo data, and then so the recall example was hard to know what it would be like when you had a real body of your own data. Would it feel super creepy? Would it be really useful? Would it be not useful because it returns so much information that you can't actually scrub through it all? I understand the problem they're trying to solve with that. Like, I think we all have the zillion tabs open that you keep open just so you, you don't forget about it. So I understand that, like, impetus behind it, but it was hard to get a sense for that for me of, like, would I personally use this and like it essentially because it was just filled with all this dumb, dummy content essentially right right you know you know Karen dummy content was actually the original title for this podcast <laughs> <laughs> some people think it still should Nailed be it. <laughs> <laughs> all right Karen Weiss thanks for coming thanks guys <laughs> <laughs> 